There's nothing I can say about this film that hasn't already been said. Once considered a masterpiece, it's gone through so many revisions over the years that a lot of people now consider it a flawed mess, tainted by George Lucas's continuous need to change what worked so well in the past and also filling his greedy, already deep pockets. Now, I'm a huge George Lucas fan, but you could have guessed that by watching my previous reviews covering the prequels. Aside from their flaws, they still had a lot of imagination and did a pretty good job of filling in the missing story gap that for so long had been missing. After all, for years, we had three films that were labeled as episodes 4, 5, and 6. When I first really got into the movies circa 1995, we still had the unaltered versions on VHS. And I have to say, even today, I never felt they needed to be updated. Most of those effects are still damn imaginative when you consider that CGI didn't exist in 1977. That opening shot of the Star Destroyer sweeping overhead is the most impressive opening shot of any film to date, and is one of the things I remember about the movie as a kid. Did we really need a digital job of the hut or an enhanced Mos Eisley to enjoy the movie? Well, as most people know, in 1997, to celebrate the film's 20th anniversary, Lucas released all three films in theaters with additional enhancements. Just to be able to see these films in the theater, on a big screen, would have been enough to get people to go see them. But to be able to see them with some fresh new things was also pretty exciting. Sure, the new effects can be a little distracting. I remember watching it in theaters and trying to spot all the new things that had been added. But the effects do look nice to me, and the important thing is that the story still stays intact. It's not as if Lucas digitally replaced all the actors. No, he waited for Empire to do that. For years I had a problem with A New Hope, simply because it was the slowest one in the trilogy. The first hour is mainly exposition and character introductions. The movie doesn't really take off until everyone leaves Tatooine and is headed en route for the Death Star. I appreciate it a lot more now, however. I think everyone loves the cantina scene where we get to see all the bizarre alien life forms. And I have to say, when you watch this back to back with episode 3, seeing Lou converse with Ben Kenobi as he reminisces about the Clone Wars has so much more resonance. How did my father die? A young Jedi named Darth Vader, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil, helped the Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. He betrayed and murdered your father. Now, for those who've never seen Star Wars, the one that most people actually refer to as simply Star Wars, here's the basic gist. In a galaxy far, far away, an evil empire rules with fear. The Emperor has constructed a weapon of mass destruction called the Death Star, which is powerful enough to destroy entire planets and make anyone bow to the Empire's will. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. Princess Leia Organa leads a group of freedom fighters, the Rebel Alliance, and at the beginning of the movie is seen giving stolen data tapes to an astromech droid named R2-D2. We're introduced to the ruthless Darth Vader, who, if you've seen the prequels, you know used to be Jedi Knight, Anakin Skywalker. Vader is ruthless in trying to find the stolen plans, and resorts to torturing the princess in order to find their whereabouts. In the meantime, the droids R2-D2 and C-3PO escape into outer space and land on the desert planet Tatooine, where they're picked up by Jawas and sold to a moisture farmer, Owen and Beru Lars. Their nephew is Luke Skywalker, who dreams of one day joining the Rebel Alliance in their fight against the Empire. When Luke is attacked by Tusken Raiders, they are scared away by an old man who Luke knows as Ben. It's revealed soon after that Ben is actually Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Jedi Knight who fought alongside Luke's father in the Clone Wars. Wanting to aid Leia in her plight, Obi-Wan tries to convince Luke to go with him to Alderaan with the stolen plans. You must learn the ways of the Force if you're to come with me to Alderaan. Luke turns down his offer at first, but then has no choice when his aunt and uncle are killed by stormtroopers. They go to Mos Eisley Spaceport, where they meet space pirate Han Solo and his Wookiee co-pilot Chewbacca, and after making a narrow escape from the Imperial forces, are forced to dock within the Death Star. While Luke and Han make a rescue attempt, Ben goes to disarm the Death Star's tractor beam, which results in a final confrontation with Vader. Escaping from the Death Star with the Princess, the Rebels uncover the Death Star's weakness and lead an all-out attack on the space station, where Luke reaches out with the Force and lands the final shot that leads them to victory. The story of a hopeless farm boy leaving the nest to go on a grand adventure resonates with everyone, which is why the film works on so many levels. It also borrows from Western mythology. The scene in the cantina where Han faces off against Greedo is a prime example of that. Lucas was also heavily influenced by Flash Gordon serials and the films of Akira Kurosawa, namely The Hidden Fortress. It's such a familiar tale that uses space fantasy to tell the story, and many critics and fans hold countless debates as to why it's held up so well. As much as I enjoy the prequels, it's hard to favor them over the classic trilogy, and personally, I prefer the tone of these films to the newer ones. 
It's not near as complex or sophisticated, and at times tends to be a bit gritty. Star Wars isn't set in a world with flawless technology and perfect architecture. It's a run-down world that has been beaten to death by smugglers and thieves, and nothing seems to work. All the vehicles seem to have a handcrafted look to them. Look at the Millennium Falcon and tell me someone didn't just Gorilla Glue a bunch of McDonald's wrappers and styrofoam together. Now the other thing I have to talk about are the different versions of the film. Lucas's original title for Star Wars was always Episode IV, A New Hope, and it wasn't originally intended as a trilogy. It was mainly inspired by the Flash Gordon serials, where each week the audience was given a different episode in an ongoing space opera. The Episode IV was meant simply as an homage to that format. As the audience, we weren't supposed to know what came before and what came after. The story starts with Vader entering the ship, and ends with the Emperor falling down the Death Star's reactor. But because of a limited budget and a fat script, Lucas had to resize the shape of his vision. Also, the studio didn't think audiences would understand the concept of a title with the number 4 in it, given that there were no other Star Wars films in existence. So the original title of the movie in 1977 was simply Star Wars. However, when the film was reissued in 1979 in anticipation for the upcoming sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, Lucas thought it was now appropriate to add in the episode number and subtitle, thus creating the full title of Episode 4, A New Hope. The film remained largely the same until its re-release in 1997, where a lot of the old-fashioned effects were changed to make the films come closer to Lucas' original vision. This was done partially as a testing bed in preparation for the upcoming prequels. The film is pretty much the same film, however, some of the bigger changes include several more shots of Mos Eisley, complete with new droids and beasts. They've added more stormtroopers to the Death Star, the Battle of Yavin was enhanced with different camera angles, the Han and Greedo confrontation was tweaked, and of course the most memorable addition was the inclusion of Jabba the Hutt. I always liked how the scene played out, with Han stepping on Jabba's tail simply to agitate him, but I watch the scene now and it's mostly unnecessary, for two reasons. First, I always liked how Jabba was only mentioned in name until we got to Return of the Jedi. And when we finally meet him, he's a really awesome and grotesque character. Having him show up in the very first film, not to mention in the prequels, demystifies him quite a bit. Also, there's no new information. Han and Greedo have the same conversation in the cantina. It's just reiterated between Han and Jabba, so it comes off more as a deleted scene than a necessary one. And fans love to debate the whole debacle about who shot first, Han or Greedo. It's silly, yes, but it lasts a fraction of a second. For those who don't know, before 1997, this scene was always depicted in which Han shoots Greedo just before Greedo can get off a shot. Apparently, Lucas didn't like how Han shot in cold blood, so in future versions it appears that Greedo got off the first shot, missed, and then Han shoots him. I have two complaints about this scene also, and they're pretty basic. First, the altered scene never quite looked right because it wasn't originally shot that way. In some versions, we see Han digitally shift to the side, and it looks pretty fake. Also, look how close the laser comes to Han's head. How could you miss when you're point blank like that? Secondly, this scene more than anything else was inspired by the old westerns, probably more than anything the Sergio Leone spaghetti westerns of the 60s. It's a beautifully constructed scene because we see Han prepare to shoot from under the table like an old gunslinger, and Greedo doesn't suspect a thing. And plus, it wasn't in cold blood. If Han hadn't shot, Greedo would have probably killed him anyway, just to collect the bounty. Having Greedo shoot first totally deconstructs the entire scene and cheats the audience out of the whole suspense of it all. Again, it's a minor detail, but unnecessary. And the trilogy was changed yet again for the 2004 DVD release. I won't go into too much detail as A New Hope was left largely unaltered, but it goes without saying that they changed the Jabba scene again, making Jabba look more aged and closer to his Jedi counterpart. Fine, I understand that, but there's something about it that is just too distracting. Jabba stands out more for some reason. I wish they would have just left him alone. Despite the countless revisions, you can pop this baby in on any given day, altered or unaltered, VHS or DVD, and just have fun with it. It goes back to the days where films were simply a lot of fun, and left devoted fans and fanboys alike, yes, there is a difference, talking amongst themselves for ages. I grew up with this movie, first subconsciously as a kid, and then as a diehard fanatic in my teens. And you know what? No matter how many times it's changed over the years, somehow it still seems like the same old Star Wars. I got a bad feeling about this.